Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to read the scripture passage in just a moment, but I want to give some, um, some glimpse into the backstory context before I read today, because um, after Easter, I wanted to share some stories of courage and faith, and I'm specifically uh, looking at people from the Old Testament. And here it is after Easter, and I'm mindful of that quote that says, we are to be an Easter people in a Good Friday world. And our world and our nation, our communities, we all know that there are challenging things, brokenness, whatever you would like to use to call it. And I wanted to lift up some people who are examples, I think, to all of us about what faith can look like. And so today we're going to talk about Moses, the most central figure to the Hebrew scriptures, the son of an enslaved Israelite woman who did the bravest thing she could do by sending her child down the river. He became the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. When Moses was being called by God to help lead Israelites to freedom from Egypt, he didn't exactly want to do it. In fact, he came up with excuses for why he shouldn't be the one to do that. He, he's a slow talker. He wasn't a good public speaker. Nobody would believe him or listen to him anyway. But Moses eventually reluctantly accepts God's call to leadership. But even then, even then, he sometimes questions God. In fact, in chapter 5, Moses says, O oh Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people. Moses accepts the call to step into the role of leadership, but he's reluctant. He has insecurities. He has his doubts. He questions God, but he doesn't. He stands up to Pharaoh, even though Pharaoh taunts him right back. And he eventually gets the Israelites to listen to him. And he even gets Pharaoh to listen to him, although the awful plague sure helped to get his attention. And we're going to be in Exodus chapter 14 today in verse 10. And I'm going to read just four verses of this whole big epic story. But I really chose these verses because I think... They're a pretty critical moment at the whole story. Pharaoh has finally said, okay, Israelites, you can go. But here's the thing. Like any good villain, <laughs> Pharaoh changes his mind. Like, like in the horror movies when you think the bad guy's dead and then he springs back up for one more scary moment. This is what Pharaoh does. He says you can go and then he changes his mind and he sends the army after the Israelites. And when our passage begins, they have fled with Moses, but they have come to have the army at their back and the sea in front of them, and they don't know what they're going to do. And are the Israelites cool, calm, and collective about this? No, they are panicky. They actually blame Moses for this entire situation. And frankly, this is one of the things I love about scripture. Here we see this story that is thousands and thousands and thousands of years old in a different culture, a different time, a different language. And you look at this story and you realize that we humans haven't changed all that much in thousands of years. They are at this critical moment at the sea. Do they trust that God's going to take care of them? No, they are panicked. They are scared and they blame Moses for getting him into this position. So here we are in Exodus 14, beginning in verse 10. It says, As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. 
But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to keep still. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to keep still. They were panicking. They wanted to raise the right flag and maybe see if Pharaoh would give them a take back and go back to being slaves again. And let me just say, I think this had to have wounded Moses. It had to feel personal. They actually say, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us to die in the wilderness? Ouch. And then they even get lower and say, we told you this was going to happen. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Moses already had his doubts in the past. He had his insecurities, moments he didn't think that he could do it, and now he hears his own people tell him that they'd rather go back to being slaves. I wanted to share this particular moment in the story with you because I happen to think this is such a critical moment. Here he is, his own doubts, his own insecurity, his own questions. They're at, a, they're at literally a dead end. And Moses could have said something different. But what he says on that shoreline with an army at their back, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Actually, I hope you haven't forgotten, we just heard that same message last Sunday. Do not be afraid is what the angel proclaims to the women at the empty tomb. Do not be afraid is what Jesus first said to the women when he encountered them on the way to go and tell the news. And here it is in this story. Moses says to the people at this critical, dead-end, frightening moment, do not be afraid. Stand firm. See the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to keep still. Sometimes I like to read the contemporary version of the message just to hear the scripture in a new way. And verse 14 actually made me laugh when I read it. This is how the message puts it. God will fight the battle for you and you... You keep your mouth shut. (laughs) That's about how we'd say it these days. Keep still or keep your mouth shut. I love it. First, first, it's a reminder to all of us when we get panicked, when life gets hard or scary, we can be tempted to do our own panic and run. We can maybe try to think if we can just outrun it, if we can just outthink it, if we can just win this hard situation with our own determination and will. Have you ever been tempted to not deal with something difficult in your life just by keeping yourself busy? Go, go, go. Run, run, run. Moses knows in this critical moment that what the Israelites need is to keep still, to be quiet, to listen and watch and see what God is about to do. And I wonder how many of us today simply need a reminder like that. God will fight the battle for you. Don't need to do anything. Listen, watch, wait. If you have already tried to fix it, if you've already tried to make it all better, to take care of it all on your own, to fix that unfixable thing, it's exhausting, isn't it? It's exhausting. And here is Moses telling the people, don't be afraid. Maybe you don't have to be the one to fix this because you weren't meant to be the one to fix this. You can only be quiet and listen and watch what God can do. You know, Anglican Archbishop of South Africa, Desmond Tutu, who's one of my spiritual heroes in life, he, he led his church in South Africa during the time of apartheid, of, 
uh, racial terrorism in, in their country, and he was a part of the reconciliation efforts in his country towards healing in the aftermath. He had what I would consider a very stressful gig. And this is actually what Desmond Tutu writes one time. He says, Dear child of God, all of us are meant to be contemplatives. Each one of us is meant to have that peace inside us where we can hear God's voice. I am deeply thankful for the moments in the early morning when I try to be quiet, to sit in the presence of the gentle and compassionate, unruffled God, to try to share in and be given some of that divine serenity. People often ask about the source of my joy, and I can honestly say that it would come from my spiritual life, specifically from these times of stillness. They are an indispensable part of my day, regardless of what else I might face. The Israelites want to panic. Moses says, be quiet, be still. Take a moment to trust. And even though it looks like you are at a dead end, God is going to make a way. And guess what? All these years later, we are still talking about what God did on the banks of that sea. We're still telling that story. Moses found faith that gave him courage to stand even when everybody else had turned against him. Even with a little army at his back, he found faith. You know, when I was a kid at, in Lexington at Tate's Creek Public Swimming Pool, was where we went to go swim all the time in the summers, and they had a high dive. Now, they've long since taken this high dive down, but back in the 80s, that's what we did. You could do things for fun that might kill you. And so uh, it's no longer there, but they had a high dive in the deep end. And I was little, and I really wanted to do it. I talked myself into it. I was going to do the high dive. And I stood in line, and I waited my turn, and I climbed up there, and I walked the plank, and I stood at the end and realized it looked way further down when you're standing up top on the top of the high dive. And I stood there probably what felt like an eternity trying to find the courage to jump. I had big kids behind me on the ladder saying, go kid, go, go. And I just couldn't do it. In fact, I had to do the swim walk of shame and I had to have the lifeguards get the people off the ladder so that I could climb back down and go back to my towel in shame. And the thing is, I tell you that story because I think sometimes for some of us, faith is like jumping off the high dive into the deep end of the pool. One big wild, courageous leap of faith, and you are in it for life, in deep for life. But I think for most of us, for a lot of us, learning to come to faith looks a lot more like it did when you were a kid just learning to swim. And your parents are standing in the shallow end, and you're at the edge of the pool, and they say, jump. And you got your hands out, and they've got their hands out to you. And you even maybe only maybe be convinced to do it if you just hold on. If you get a finger, a pinky to hold on to, you'll jump. And it goes little by little, little by little. You find the courage to learn how to leap because you know that they are going to be there. Because they've been there every other time. You learn to trust that they will not let you fall. Moses, he was an unlikely leader, a guy convinced he didn't have the right gifts, a guy convinced nobody would ever listen to him. Moses, the guy who sometimes even questioned God, stood on the side of that sea and finally got it. He finally remembered God had gotten him this far. God had gotten them this far. Do not be afraid. 
Amen.